Um, so welcome to this uh, virtual round table. My name is Peter Braga. Oh, we still, yeah, we still work. Okay. Um, can someone give me an indication you can still hear me because my screen has just given up. Hey. Hello? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, fantastic. My apologies, I'll, I'll keep going. All right. Um, so my name is Peter Braga. I'm a researcher at the School of Slavonic and East European Studies. The title of uh, tonight's event is uh, Current Events in Belarus, a roundtable discussion for the LSE Student Union European Society. Um, there are four speakers here today. Each will speak for 10 minutes. This should leave us uh, at least 20 to 30 minutes uh, for questions and discussion. I will give an outline of each uh, speaker and, um, uh, sorry, I'll give an introduction of each speaker and what they'll be speaking about. Okay, the first speaker is Alex Kokcharov, who is a risk analyst for IHS Market, uh, an information firm based in London. Alex will give an overview of the conditions and events that led to the 2020 election protests, which are currently ongoing in Belarus. The second speaker is Professor uh, Miklos Harasti, who among many other important positions was the UN Special Rapporteur on Human Rights in Belarus from 2012 to 2018. Uh, Miklos will give an overview of human rights in Belarus under the Lukashenko regime. And then he will also comment on the human rights situation there since the uh, 2020 elections and protests. Uh, the third speaker tonight will be Professor Aliana Markova, who teaches at Charles University in Prague. Uh, she is an expert on Russian national identity. Oh, sorry, Belarusian national identity. Um, Alena will discuss the divide between um, Belarusian national identity and the Belarusian state and how this is impacting the protests. The final speaker is um, Ricard uh, Josviak, who is, a, um, who is at, who's the Europe editor at Radio Free Europe and Radio Liberty at their Prague Bureau. Ricard will comment on the international dimension to the elections and the current protest crackdown. Specifically, he will highlight issues of sanctions and or foreign support for the Lukashenko regime. And um, I'm just gonna give a, li a little bit of housekeeping um, before we get moving. So if my connection or someone else's is uh, broken or disconnected, uh, we will wait for a few seconds. If they do not get reconnected, we will move on to the next roundtable speaker. And then hopefully we'll be able to come back to them to finish their time um, you know, after the, the, the speaker who's replaced them. If I am somehow disconnected, uh, Elena Markova will uh, take over for me as acting chair. Okay, so, um, and now each speaker will begin their talk for uh, 10 minutes. And so, uh, Alex Kokcharov, uh, please take it away. Hi, hello. Thank you so much for having me. And if that's okay, I can share a slide. So we'll share. Oh, I cannot. Uh, I cannot share a slide, right? Because it, I, yes, I, you you can. I will just give you the right. Okay, to if you could. Thank you so much. Um, about the Belarusian process of this year. Um, Okay. Oh, yes. I'm going to share it now. Yep. Um, so as we all know, can you see the slide? Yes. Great. Uh, the protests are now in their fourth month. They began uh, on the evening of 9th of August, the day of uh, disputed presidential election, uh, which was largely not recognized by um, uh, much of the international community, including Western countries. The protests are still ongoing and they are unexpectedly large. Uh, over the time since August, uh, we've seen more than 30,000 people detained in Belarus. Most of these detentions were temporary, sometimes for periods of only several hours and in some cases several days or several weeks. But there are uh, nearly 150 political prisoners right now, and this number is steadily rising. 
There are multiple criminal cases, nearly a thousand criminal cases initiated against the protesters. There is a lot of police violence happening. And uh, based on the figures we see, this is the largest wave of political repression in Europe uh, for since late 70s, early, early 80s. We haven't seen anything on this scale um, for an extended period of time. Uh, what we have now, we have the administration of uh, President Lukashenko, which is not recognized by uh, the European Union, uh, by the US, Canada, UK, um, many other countries in Europe, including Ukraine, which is an important um, neighbor for Belarus, but he's recognized by Russia. So how did we arrive here? When the election was only starting in spring of this year, uh, to be honest, I did not expect that we, we're going to see this unprecedented um, uh, civil unrest in Belarus. Uh, it was not something I did expect. I did expect some protests to take place because I did expect that there would be significant um, manipulation uh, in the election and it won't be free. But I expected that the use of force uh, by the police and security forces would uh, lead to the protests being dispersed and the key opposition figures detained, as it was the case in 2010. However, what happened this year is that when a lot of heavy force was used by the police, it actually triggered protests growing larger. and. Uh, on the, the, uh, the first Sunday after uh, the start of the protest, there have been more than 100,000 people in Minsk, and there have been certain days where some estimates put the numbers of perhaps 250,000 people, which is a lot for Minsk, uh, joining these rallies. There were also labor strikes, and uh, we've seen that you know there is a significant uh, disobedience happening in the country. So far, the status quo is still in place, and I do expect that it's likely to remain in place in the six-month outlook. Uh, but this has been unprecedented, and the reasons for that are multiple. First, the fatigue. Lukashenko has been in power for 26 years, uh, and there is a significant fatigue uh, of the same very small a uh, group of people ruling uh, a country of over 9 million people. Secondly, uh, a significant role was played by the way Lukashenko's administration handled the start of the coronavirus pandemic early in the year. Uh, Lukashenko was very dismissive of the, uh, of the uh, uh, pandemic and uh, it cost him support of many people who uh, we're concerned that what would happen to them if they catch this disease. And we're talking about, you know, many of, um, uh, about many people in the social groups which traditionally would have supported Lukashenko. For instance, uh, pensioners, older people, people working uh, in the uh, government sector, such as healthcare sector. Uh, but they were basically left alone with the start of the disease. Belarus was one of, uh, very few countries in the world which didn't introduce any restrictions in spring. And uh, those people who were contracting coronavirus had to deal with it on their own. And basically they knew they could not really rely on support from the government, whether in them being treated or receiving any help for any lost income. Uh, Another big factor was a mistake which was done by the uh, Lukashenko administration when Svetlana Tikhanovska, uh, the wife of prominent uh, YouTube blogger Sergei Tikhanovsky, was registered as a candidate uh, to run in this election. And this comes from entrenched um, misogynistic approach by Lukashenko uh, who dismissed the fact that women can be a challenge to him. From his perspective, uh, women could not challenge him, and uh, you know he made a number of public statements on this. And actually, these statements actually also cost him a number of votes, as many female voters were deeply offended by the fact that 
um, he was so dismissive of women and their potential for politics. So a combination of these multiple factors led to this unprecedented um, uh, transformation in Belarus, where we, uh, we have a situation where Lukashenko most probably has lost the election. We don't know for sure. Uh, and we probably will never find out because the ballots have been destroyed. There is no way to recount them. Uh, he, he most probably lost the election and most probably uh, Svetlana Tikhanovska uh, is president-elect. Uh, however, she was forced into exile, but she's uh, very active right now in the uh, international community, uh, trying to establish a coalition uh, which would push for more uh, change in Belarus and which would push the current administration of Lukashenko, which is not viewed as legitimate by uh, majority of Western countries and some important neighbors, including uh, Ukraine, as legitimate, uh, would start engaging in dialogue with the opposition and would consider transition or an early election uh, or other options uh, to solve this political crisis. Have I think the fact that Russia continues its support to Belarus politically, financially, and potentially is willing to offer security assistance if protests become uh, a bigger challenge to the authorities in Minsk, uh, is likely to mean that Lukashenko will still be in power uh, within the next six months. I don't think he will be able to serve his full term five years but I think he will be resisting uh, all uh, demands for him to step down. And the fact that Russia continues its support for Belarus uh, means that uh, Lukashenko is more likely to step down, uh, more likely to stay in power rather than to step down. Uh, and with this, uh, I'm gonna give floor to the next participants, but I'm, I'm sure there will be many more questions in Q&A uh, and uh, I'll be able to deal with those uh, later on. So I'll stop sharing. Okay, um, thank you so much, um, Alex. That was uh, very informative. Thanks for giving us sort of a, an introduction to everything that's going on at the moment. I also um, wanted to add that if anybody has questions for the speakers, feel free to um, put your questions into uh, the chat uh, so type in your question if you'd like us to, um, you know, see it and uh, speak about it. Um, and uh, so to our second speaker, uh, Mikos. Thank you and greetings to all. Do you hear me? Yeah. So um, about the famous system of Belarus, um, it's, um, um, it's human rights system basically. It's a commonplace uh, cliche that it is Europe's last dictatorship, uh, but I, I, I tend to disagree with this. I think it is, and it's very important in evaluating that system, that it is the first post-Soviet dictatorship in Europe, in fact. Um, and um, uh, an exemplary one, in fact, um, Belarus's evolution in the last uh, 26 years, or basically since the collapse of European communism and particularly collapse of the Soviet Union, um, it is an exemplary, a textbook case of how post-communist democracy um, can be diverted in a populism-based illiberal way and not towards democracy as transitology once believed, but but away from democracy. Um, Belarus has been a laboratory of the bureaucratic and, um, and semi-terroristic um, and illiberal methods at um, diversion of democracy, um, where the basic feature of the system is to keep seemingly multi-party elections uh, while um, all democratic institutions are turned into Potomkin walls, and even election itself is not fair and free. Um, 
the method, the essence of the method is an initial popularity grab, a populist popularity grab um, at, at one of the free elections in Belarus's cases in the last free election. And then it is followed by an abusive power grab. And then in turn, the kidnapped institutions serve to perpetualize election victories and keep uh, the leaders' populism efficient uh, by several methods, like changes in constitution, in the electoral law, um, the subordination of all independent institutions, centralization and personification of power, and uh, his or his clans or his political families' um, domination of the economy. Um, very importantly, uh, suppression of pluralism also comes in the media and um, combined with a pervasive omnipresent propaganda machine, regardless if the media is state owned or nominally privately owned, and that helps apart from the electoral law, et cetera, to deprive the electorate from an informed choice. Um, of course, uh, while multi-party elections nominally remain, um, the actual chances of the opposition parties, of candidates, are constantly and systematically ruined, mostly by bureaucratic ways which are nominally democracy passed, parliament passed, or uh, confirm uh, with the constitution, which is of course also fabricate, has been fabricated by Lukashenko. And uh, it's important, but not our subject, that this laboratory of illiberalism has its spell westward as well, not only eastward. In many respects, Putin can be called a pupil of Lukashenko at these methods, but uh, I am in I am speaking now from a country which has very warm relationships with Belarus and not by chance. So um, very important, the very special, actually unique, even compared to other uh, illiberal uh, dictatorships, um, the economic system of Belarus, which is neither the remnant nor a remake of, of, of communism, despite that 60 to 80 percent, based on different estimate, estimates, is state owned of the economy. And despite, <clears throat> this is a propaganda element of Lukashenkoism, if you wish, that um, he famously reta retained, preserved Soviet time symbolisms, which is working as a kind of communist nationalism based on the heroism and suffering of the Belarus people during Second World War, but, uh, but I'm sure that Alena can speak more about that. Um, now, in the economy, um, this 80, sometimes 80% 80 of, of uh, central command gives Lukashenko a power to raise wages by decree and and lower consumer prices by decree, which of course contributes to a popularity won already during the first election where he, where he promised to avoid the Russian type collapse of workforce, joblessness, and, um, and uh, the, the so-called um, shock therapy which he, of course, consistently and successfully portrayed as um, misery to be avoided. Now, um, after winning that first election, um, he followed with an with a altered constitution, put through in a one package, um, uh, referendum, which had many, many tenets from uh, legitimizing death penalty 
which the country retains alone in Europe. Um, and it is a kind of symbol of Lukashenko's deciding power. He could, he could at any moment, of course, order um, a, a suspension of um, at least of executions, but he doesn't do it because he sees it as, as a kind of um, a symbol of his power. And um, the many, many tenets of that constitution basically handed an absolute power to govern by decree to Lukashenko on, on, two, on two counts. One is two thirds of parliament can, can uh, give him special powers and directly from constitution flows some of those powers, but what about parliament? For 26 years, only two independent uh, candidates have made it into that parliament, which otherwise is named. The members of parliament are named by Lukashenko. And uh, to what, um, to what uh, you, Mr. Braga said, uh, no, I'm sorry, um, you spoke about, about uh, it, was, it was Ricard about the misogynistic character of Lukashenko's power, um, those two candidates allowed um, um, into parliament were women. In Lukashenko's view, that was to stress their powerlessness or ineptitude. And that kind of handling actually contributed to this women's revolution, which we see now in a, in a very, very impressive way. Uh, I mean, the, the, um, the revolt against that despisal of women. Now, um, I would like to continue with the brief description of the human rights system. It is an, uh, basically an innovative um, system. It consists of three filters, um, which lame every and each uh, right to uh, basically public rights. The first filter is that all public activities, um, be it gathering, be it speech, um, or be it association, are tied to a bureaucratic permission. The second filter is that that, filter, that permission is impossible to get. That, that, that permission goes through a Kafkaesque and totally arbitrary system of um, giving that permission. And um, the rules are changed on the go. And uh, basically, only regime conform or exemplary uh, um, uh, unique cases get permitted. And the third and the crowning jewel of that of that system is that acting on any right without permission is a crime it was during my um, reportership that they changed um, those uh, laws that make it a crime from the criminal code into the so-called administrative code but the both the descriptions of the deed and the actual punishments remained very much the same. And finally, this constant repression and punishment for public activity, which by now generations of Belarusians have, have, um, have experienced, and it in every generation until today, uh, until now, lamed public life, are uh, mixed with a recurring uh, alternating open terror, typically around elections, before, during, or after elections. As it happened, uh, 2010, December, uh, also it was a clearly and um, impertinently rigged uh, election process. And the protests after, after which were suppressed so brutally that the 
United Nations human rights system. It was then that they established the rapporteurship. Um, and finally, this is what we have seen now and already has been described. And later I am ready to speak about um, some other reasons why now and uh, neither this uh, slowly working mill of uh, deprivation of human rights, which typically ends up in two or two or one two week or one week uh, administrative detention, and the, the alternating open terror. Why it didn't work this time? The last word. Why Lukashenko was able, or why he spoke about criminals who are on the street, because many of those protesters very probably have been during their lifetime once at least punished with those ad administrative uh, methods. So they, that, that's how he abusively calls them criminal. I right. finished here. Yeah, thank you so much. And uh, now we're moving on to uh, Aliana Markova. Well, thanks again for inviting me. I hope that you hear me uh, well. So just let me know if something is uh, something like a trouble with my sound. So um, again, thank you very much. And as a historian, I will be happy to provide some historical context of the current protest and the conflict between two um, identities. And as you see, there is a um, clear conflict between two identities now, state identity and a national identity in Belarus. And um, actually, I can, as you can see from like on different photos, for example, um, protesters, they are carrying a traditional Belarusian national state symbols. Now, uh, it means I'm talking about the red, white, white, red, white national flag and Pahonia or pursued coat of arms. And uh, what does that mean? Pursued, uh, well, let, let me describe it just to, to visualize it. Pursued, uh, actually, uh, this is an um, armed knight on a white horse against the black ground background of a red shield with a six pointed golden cross. And what does it mean from the historical perspective, these new states, uh, these uh, national symbols? These national symbols refer to the Belarusian pre-Soviet history. And um, it means the coat of arm uh, knight refers to the medieval history of the Grand Duchy of Lithuania, which incorporated ethnically Belarusian lands, and flag refers to the symbolic legacy of the interwar Belarusian People's Republic, which was a democratic alternative of the Soviet Belarus supported by Bolsheviks. And these symbols were chosen as state symbols after the proclamation of independence of the Republic of Belarus, and they were introduced on September 1991. Um, however, after Lukashenko had come to power in 1994, uh, it means only three years later, uh, Lukashenko initiated a massive campaign to return Soviet symbols, and um, he managed to organize the national referendum um, next year, in 1995, to, um, despite massive protest of parliament. And one of the main questions of this referendum in 1995 was reinstalling Russian as the second state language, and um, another question was related to reintroducing uh, former Soviet state symbols. And well, this question uh, in May 1995 was approved by a majority of votes. And therefore, a slightly modified 
Skopje's red and green national flag and emblem with five pointed red star and round ribbon were introduced instead of the traditional national symbol. And today, now we can observe that traditional national symbols in the hands of protesters mean strong disagreement with the present Lukashenko's ideological campaign, um, ideological direction uh, and politics. And because in fact, Lukashenko offers old Soviet identity instead of national identity. And the Soviet identity is not supported by the majority of Belarusian citizens. Um, majority of the Belarusian citizens don't share it anymore, as you can see it now. And in this case, um, today's strong support of the national symbols means support of an idea of independent Belarus before or without Lukashenko. Uh, I mean, period of the Parliament, uh, parliamentary republic before Lukashenko, it means before 1994. Uh, and actually, um, the new identity, like old new national identity, actually, uh, this is a symbol of a future transformation of Belarus free of Soviet um, state identity. And Actually, if I if I if I can make make um, some like a parallel, probably I uh, might mention the activities of the coordination council for the transfer of power established uh, by Svetlana Tikhanovska uh, in August uh, to provide a democratic transfer of power, um, and the coordination council has stated the very similar goal. Uh, it means to return to the Russian constitution of 1994. Uh, it means the period of the uh, parliamentary republic before Lukashenko, before uh, 1994. Um, so um, that's it. And uh, thank you very much. I will be glad for your question. Um, the Russian identity and so on. Thank you. Thank you so much, Eliana. And um, so passing it on to uh, Ricard, who will be uh, talking about um, uh, sanctions and sort of the international perspective. So hello, everyone, and thank you very much for inviting me to this. Uh, very much like Alex during the first uh, presentation, I'm, I'm quite skeptical, uh, in fact, um, about the chances of the democratic opposition in Belarus. In fact, uh, even though we have reached a sort of stalemate right now, sort of impasse, I would say that the big victor so far, uh, and probably for quite a foreseeable future is Vladimir Putin and Russia, and as a good runner up is uh, Alexander Lukashenko. Um, why is that? Uh, roughly speaking, this I think because Putin has Belarus exactly where he wants it right now. Um, he has a weakened Alexander Lukashenko that is closer to Moscow now than it is to any uh, Western powers. It's as simple as that. And why do I say that? I think it's roughly speaking because of the relative strength of the Lukashenko regime and Russia compared to the weakness of the West in this case. Um, the, th the three main weaknesses about the West when it comes to, to Belarus. Um, the first one is that the West, and I'm talking here now about the United States, UK, and especially the European Union, uh, doesn't have much leverage when it comes to Belarus in the first place, never had. Uh, unlike uh, Moldova, Georgia, Ukraine, uh, the EU doesn't have a free trade agreement uh, with Belarus. It, in fact, it doesn't even have a political association agreement as such. So it's left already before the crisis to deal the political and economical links aren't very strong. Of course, it is with certain bilateral countries, such as Poland, Lithuania, but the EU as a bloc really doesn't have much exchange to begin with when it comes to Belarus. And what it has 
when it comes to whips then is, is sanctions. And as you know, after some teething problems, the EU finally uh, adopted sanctions uh, against uh, Belarus in two rounds now, and there are currently 55 people being sanctioned. That means an asset freeze and a visa ban getting into the European Union. UK has a, a similar thing, slightly fewer people. United States will also have few. Um, but these, are, these sanctions, even though they target Lukashenko and his inner circle, are symbolic. Uh, I'm saying that because if you ask the officials, they will say reluctantly that, well, you know, there aren't that many Belarusian in the regime that actually have that many assets in the EU anymore. And if they did, it took such a long time for the EU to, to um, impose these asset freezes that by the time they were announced, those bank accounts have already been cleansed. Also the visa, the, the visa lib thing, may, may, sorry, the, the fact that they can't uh, enter into the European Union can be waived. Uh, this is something that, you know, if some of them who are on the list uh, wants to go to the EU, uh, there is a chance that an individual member state still can waive that one. So, so this sort of thing is also in very much sense, even though it, it's good and the EU is going to impose more sanctions, so it's probably United States, um, as long as they don't impose big economic sectoral sanctions on Belarus, uh, these are symbolical. Another thing is about, I would say, Western bandwidth at the moment. As you've probably seen, there are, <laughs> there are many other things going on in the world right now. And I'm just, you know, when I speak to, for example, EU officials and I ask them about Belarus and say, well, you know, it's Brexit right now. It's an EU budget of 1.8 trillion that is being stopped by uh, Poland and Hungary. There's, you know, a rule of law issues in Hungary uh, and, and Poland as well that Miklos referred to. Uh, there's a civil war in Libya. There are fights, constant fights with Turkey. Both those conflicts might trigger a huge new migration wave to the EU. And of course, and when you talk about the US, they've been completely obsessed about their own election and if there will actually be a, a, a transition, you know, from, from Trump to Biden. And, and thirdly, I think we've got a question about that, about the international, orga international organizations. Um, let's be frank, um, they've been completely sidelined. Um, the UN is, sorry to say, not a player in Belarus, uh, largely because Russia obviously has a veto power there. But even uh, the organization that uh, people had hoped would maybe solve something, the OSE, has been brutally sidelined, I would say. Uh, Belarus, Russia are blocking all sorts of construction, uh, constructive talks in Vienna at the moment. And, and you know, there's no mediation, there are mediation efforts, but they're not allowed to come into Belarus. There was a, a wonderful report written uh, by the OSCE, by an uh, Austrian human rights lawyer, uh, but, but uh, Belarus basically blocked, blocked it from, me, from him from coming to Belarus and reports. So there is a report that's being written from Vienna, essentially. And you can also see in another conflict right now in Nagorno-Karabakh, where the OSCE also was supposed to be a big player, uh, it ended up being nothing because Russia and Turkey in that sense um, created a ceasefire out of nothing that completely sidelined the OSCE. So, so really, if there's anything uh, we have seen uh, when it comes to the Eastern neighborhood of Europe is that OSCE and the UN are sidelined. They, 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 they are simply not players. Uh, at the same time, uh, the strength of Lukashenko and Putin is obvious. Of course, Lukashenko has been shaken by this. This is clear. But when you look at it, there has been no major defection in the nomenclatura. There's no, there's no one challenging his power from within. There's no heir. There's no crown prince or crown princess. And um, he has total support, it seems like, from the intelligence service, from the military, and this sort of thing is crucial. And then again, he's backed up by Russia. And, and Russia has backed him up, not only uh, you know, security-wise, political-wise, media-wise, uh, and potentially probably in the end also money-wise. So, so uh, really, I, I, I don't really see much hope yet anytime soon when it comes to uh, the democratic opposition. However, there are a few things where I think maybe we can see some light at the end of the tunnel. Um, one is that um, there has been, as uh, the previous speaker said, there has been a bit of a Belarusian national awakening. The protest movement will not go away, and this will continue to be a headache uh, for, uh, for Lukashenko going forward, because the nation is split, uh, and, and that will continue. That will not move, basically. Um, when I speak to Western diplomats, I think they have understood that this is a long game. 
it's a bit like a support the Western support for uh, Warsaw Pact satellites during the Cold War. Uh, the support needs to be there, but it's not something that will be solved anytime soon. But if something happens, we need to be prepared. So I'm, I'm quite heartened to see both individual European Union member states, but also uh, the EU as such are preparing things and especially uh, pledging to help the civil society and trying to find a way to channel money to civil society in Belarus that will not enrich uh, the states uh, and the Lukashenko regime. That's tricky, but they're working on it. And I do think they will solve a way of supporting independent media, journalists, students to come and study, for example, in the United States or the EU. And, and, and finally, I also think that it's very positive that um, Joe Biden won in America. Uh, under Donald Trump, this whole region, um, so the Eastern Partnership, the Eastern neighborhood of the European Union was completely abandoned by the Trump administration, I would say. Um, and I think there is a big chance now that at least we will see a sort of US, Canadian, UK, EU access form, that they will at least be on the same page. I think that is important. But the, the thing that might finally um, help Belarus, and it's the same thing I sent, say to my my friends in, in Georgia, that I sent to my friends in Ukraine, in Moldova, is that your, your road, so to say, into the West, whether it's EU membership or, or, or NATO membership, or just being less dependent on Russia, goes via Moscow. And the real hope is that one day there will be a, a, a pro, a, a liberal reformer in the Kremlin that will allow these countries, not only Belarus, but others, uh, recognize them that they actually are countries that are sovereign and don't have limited sovereignty but until there is such a change in moscow i'm afraid that these countries and especially belarus with all the links they have economically politically military with russia will be stuck in the moscow orbit for uh, for a foreseeable time and on that happy note i hand it over <laughs> All right. Um, thank you so much to all our speakers. Um, just before I open the floor to questions, um, and feel free to continue to put uh, questions into the chat, um, I just wanted to promote two um, additional events. Um, the, the, the first I would like to put forward is there will be another roundtable organized by the LSE uh, Student Union, Union European Society on the 9th of December, and it will be covering the demonstrations in uh, Poland. Um, and the other event I would like to promote is, um, rather selfishly, is one that I help organize. It is the Belarusian Studies in the 21st Century Conference. Um, the call for papers has just, uh, well, hasn't just gone out. It's been out for a while, um, but the uh, call for papers closes on the 20th of, or not the 20th, sorry, the, the 30th of November. And uh, the conference will be running from 19th to 20th of February, 2021. And this year's speaker will be David Marples. Um, some of you in, who research Belarus may know him. Um, and he has an excellent keynote. It's called um, Stalin's Ghosts, Parasites, the States, the, sorry, the State and the Origin of the uh, 2020 Election Protests. Um, so we, uh, I encourage you to please come and I'll put a link up in the, co in the comments uh, to, to our conference that you can click on and check out. So I'm just gonna pop this in and it'll be done over Zoom and everything. So if you don't happen to be in London, um, that's all right. So there, I popped it in the chat if you'd like to take a look. Okay, so um, I'm going to go to the first question that was um, posed to Alex, and I'm going to summarize it. So Alex, do you think Russia will continue supporting Lukashenko even when the majority of the people are against him, and uh, will this promote anti-Russian sentiment in Belarus? I think Russia would, of course, prefer to work with um, a leader in Belarus who is popular. But I don't think that Russian options are limited here. Russia has demonstrated in the past that it is willing to work with unpopular leaders. Look at Syria and Assad. Uh, and uh, as long as it uh, promotes Russian policy objectives. Um, and I would argue that from the Russian perspective, unpopular, weakened Lukashenko can be an asset 
because he will be weak. He will be weak on the external front with the sanctions in place, with the European Union and other Western countries isolating him and pushing him into the Kremlin's uh, arms. And he's weak domestically, being unpopular and challenged by the protests and labor strikes and, and, and uh, other events uh, at home. Which means that Russia's ability of arms twisting Lukashenko for various concessions is much higher than it would have been otherwise when he would be popular domestically. Yes, there is an issue of um, uh, falling support for Russia in Belarus. This has been uh, both anecdotal, but also there was a poll published earlier this week, which uh, according to which uh, support for integration with Russia has fallen by uh, 11 percentage points uh, in two months, which is quite significant. Uh, still, uh, there is more support for integration with Russia than with the European Union. So Russia hasn't lost the public opinion in Belarus, despite ongoing uh, uh, willingness to support Lukashenko. Uh, but I think Russia is willing to, to deal with this matter, even if population turns not particularly happy about Russia. But if Russia manages to get concessions from Lukashenko, and this uh, these can range from economic, such as uh, uh, Russian uh, businesses gaining uh, lucrative economic assets in Belarus, such as uh, oil refineries or uh, certain other uh, manufacturers. If Russia can get military bases in Belarus, I think it will be something that will be on the agenda. Uh, we know this because the current lease for two military installations Russia has in Belarus expires in July 2021, which means that it needs, it needs to be extended. Uh, Russia will be likely to push for a proper military base. It has tried to do so back in 2015, but back at the time, Lukashenko was in much stronger position. He was rebalancing relations with the European Union. He had sanctions removed against him by the West. Uh, he was trying to rebuild relations with the, EU, with the US. So he managed back at the time to rebuff Russian advances. Now when he's weak, he will be, it will be much more difficult for him to do so. And I think Russia will be pushing Lukashenko on the uh, issue of political integration uh, within the framework of the Union state of Russia, Belarus. And I think they will want more concessions which would fundamentally erode Belarusian sovereignty politically and economically. So I would argue that weakened Lukashenko and popular Lukashenko can be in Moscow's interest here. All right, thank you. Very interesting. Um, all right, so, and now I have a um, another question. Uh, so who I, which I will, um, well, I'll leave it to everyone. Uh, you know, uh, please chime in if, uh, if you'd like to comment. So uh, in November 2019, a large opposition presence was at the ceremonial reburial of the 1863 uprising leaders. Seeing the size of this opposition group present, um, uh, this, the, the person asking the question wants to know, um, would massive protest against the regime, would it just be a matter of time seeing that there was such a large um, opposition group present? Uh, what do the, what do the uh, roundtable speakers think? Yeah, Alia? So, um, let me be first. Uh, well, thank you very much for interesting question. However, uh, probably, well, for the first time, I probably I will not disagree with the definition and formulation, um, it means like Belarusian opposition, uh, because I do not think that this is all about opposition, because um, I guess um, this is um, people, uh, because I must say that um, I can observe that uh, lately national idea um, they are getting more and more massive support. For example, um, Belarusian language, unprestigious Belarusian language, or for example, um, in case of, for example, um, celebration.
looks like um i have lost Alan. yeah Lena may has, may have lost the connection there um yeah, what i think i will do seeing that she doesn't appear to be coming back right away is uh, we'll move on to the next question hopefully she'll she'll get reconnected so my next question is for ricard and the question is won't russia uh, sorry won't sanctions against belarus harm the belarusian people and I might extend the que this question. Um, will sanctions essentially sort of drive Belarus towards Russia, perhaps? Anyways, but yeah, so there's your question record. Yes, on both questions, I would say. Uh, on economic sanctions, yeah, that's the reason why the EU, at least, but also the United States, uh, uh, are quite reluctant to impose the sort of sweeping electoral sanction that hits certain fields. And that's why they focus on uh, individual sanctions and individual companies, which will come very soon in the case of the EU. Uh, yes, the economic sanctions would disproportionately hit ordinary people. And that's exactly the sort of thing that uh, the West wants to avoid. Uh, so, so I don't think that that will actually happen in the end. Uh, what they will do is targeted personal sanctions and sanctions on uh, companies that are linked, uh, closely linked to the re regime and that's sort of an evidence-based uh, reason why they're linked to regime and why they need to be sanctioned basically. Uh, and then uh, whether sanctions will push um, um, Lukashenko regime close to Russia, yes, as well. I think we saw that already back in 2010 uh, when the EU imposed sanctions after the presidential elections back then. It was in 2011, the presidential elections were in December 2010, and in 2011 the EU imposed sanctions again on Lukashenko, which Alex referred to, and they lifted that in 2015-16. Back then, you know, Belarus also turned to Russia for a few years and then did its regular I would say Brussels, uh, Moscow tango. It, Lukashenko is a master on playing the EU against Russia and so on. So usually it's great milking these two, but yeah, uh, right now the pendulum has swung uh, or the Lukashenko tango has swung towards uh, uh, Moscow again and will be there for a while now. Okay, great. Um, and so, and I'm moving on to a fourth question uh, that I've uh, paraphrased. Um, so and I'm opening this question to all the members of the round table. Um, so what sort of impact will the, this crisis is going on right now have for Belarus's neighbors? Um, yeah, so, and if they have, if the EU imposes sanctions, what sort of impact will that have for the, you know, the neighborhood, you know, uh, countries adjacent to Belarus? Anybody want to um, answer? Yeah. If, if, if I may, um, uh, actually, uh, these countries, particularly the Baltic states, are more proactive than the European Union at large in uh, uh, driving uh, Belarus towards the top of the agenda. Uh, uh, Lithuania, in particular, is extremely active, and uh, it's uh, spearheading the initiatives of introducing sanctions, and Baltic states were first, actually, to introduce personal sanctions against Belarusian officials and then demanded the European Union to follow. Uh, Poland is also quite active, uh, providing significant funds for supporting Belarusian um, um, civil society and Belarusian media students who have been expelled from uh, the country. Poland announced that um, uh, from either now or very soon, those Belarusian citizens who, will, who are getting humanitarian visas will will not need to seek a work permit for employment in Poland. So it is fundamentally opening up its labor market for those people who are persecuted in Belarus. So these countries are actually um, uh, driving uh, the response and they're much more active than European Union as a whole. Um, and in my view, they will actually benefit because there will be a brain drain. Uh, similar brain drains have happened in the past and a lot of educated and skilled Belarusians with transferable skills, uh, including in sectors such as IT, will be moving to Poland or Lithuania or Latvia or Estonia. Uh, we see that uh, the Belarusian IT sector was hit by the authorities, by regulatory demands, 
Um, and this is largely due to the fact that there was a lot of support among many IT firms in Belarus uh, to, to the protest movement and to the, uh, you know, uh, to support uh, Tikhanovsk and support uh, opposition forces. And now many firms are actually evacuating from Belarus. Uh, there are reports of at least dozens of Belarusian firms uh, moving operations to nearby countries, and this includes Baltic states, Poland, and Ukraine. And so fundamentally, they will benefit from, uh, you know, uh, from all these talented Belarusian people and businesses uh, moving to their markets. Yes, there will be some losses. Uh, potentially, some Baltic ports would lose, um, would lose some cargo, which will now go via Russia. But overall, probably the there will be more losses for Belarus than to these European Union countries. Uh, and we have to remember that uh, Belarus needs them as they need Belarus in terms of at least some trade. So Belarus will not stop all trade with, with these countries. If, if I may as well, I 100% agree with, with uh, Alex on everything and it's also no coincidence that uh, Svetlana Cichanukha ended up in, in, in Vilnius. You know, like Lithuania has been the main driver of uh, EU uh, Belarusian policy, basically, and they have gone much further. Uh, right now, the EU is talking about the third sanctions package. And while the talks, you know, in Western capitals about let's add 10, 20 more names, Vilnius or Lithuania wants, you know, let's add 120 more names. So, so they are really the driving force in that, incidentally, and, and backed, of course, by, by Estonia, Latvia and Poland to a lesser extent. And does anybody else want to chime in on this same question or shall I move on to others? Do you have more questions, actually? Yes, we do. We have some we have some prepared questions. If the if the floor uh, doesn't issue any more, um, yeah, I, I just later would like to contribute in a tiny detail to to certainly. That said, it's a previous point. Uh, go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah. So uh, I fully agree. It's a very very good analysis from um, from the panel. Where I slightly disagree is um, the possibility of durability of Lukashenko's rule. If you wish in a moral, mental sense. So I believe that Lukashenko's regime has become an ancient regime in the classic sense, in the, in the eyes of uh, not only of the educated population, I believe, if you have data about this, like, Alex or, or Richard, please uh, uh, confront me with that. But I think the, that the loss of, uh, of um, legitim legitimacy has extended beyond the educated. Um, um, and um, it is already in that weak position, um, puppet-like position already that uh, <clears throat> Alex and, and Richard described vis-a-vis uh, -vis Russia already. And there is no way, I believe, for Lukashenko to get out of that. So his, his rule in a very important moral sense, legitimacy sense, cannot be restored. And that is a very important point, especially as um, um, Putin's actually maybe, as somebody already mentioned, privatizing um, Belarus's state-owned economy for his oligarchs, for Putin's oligarchs, and um, and um, except if Lukashenko can spectacularly increase uh, um, level of, of of welfare for society, which I don't see how he could do that, I believe, in a moral sense, his rule is over. Right. May I raise something there? I mean, I, will, I want to challenge Miklos a bit. I, I hope he's right. May I? Yes. Uh, Miklos, I, I, I hope you're right. Um, however, I see one uh, maybe parallel in the world right now, uh, which I, I, I'm not a big fan of comparing regimes to each other, but I am quite afraid that 
Belarus might end up in a sort of Venezuela situation uh, where we see Nicolas Maduro, who's also lost the popular intellectual moral support maybe in Venezuela, but somehow still managed to hold, cling on to industry and military and intelligence service, and then still being able to, to cling on to power. And I'm, I'm afraid a bit to challenge you a bit, even though I hope you're right, that uh, Belarus might get into that sort of same Venezuela frame for quite a few years going forward. Okay, I'm not claiming he can be overthrown. Um, and while Putin doesn't want that. But, um, but I am claiming that from the, from the sectors you have mentioned, in Belarus, it is only it is only the economy which is still somewhat in his hand, because secret service military is already in Putin's hand. So an outcome might be, as actually both Alex and you have indicated, the outcome might be a kind of solution, maybe with Babarika or Babarika type uh, um, um, politicians who do support. Uh, a certain fair amount of democratization, but at the same time, um, realistically, would like to still tie Belarus to Russia. So I believe that if Putin doesn't want to have a laterally weakened Lukashenko at the helm, then he would sooner or later, I believe, maybe surprisingly soon, would revert to a type of political solution with, with such a political outcome and with a certain amount of democratization, which will be a victory for the movement, while of course would not alter, as you called it, Belarus being on the Russian orbit. Right, okay. And I'm, I, we just got two questions that just came in, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna field them um, and I will, um, yeah, so the, the first one, I, I think Ricard would be best placed to answer this. However, again, this is a round table, so anybody else can chime in. So um, why do you think the EU has been, well, the EU has been so slow to respond to the crisis? And then the, the person asking the question says, well, could this be because of uh, Belarus's ties with Russia? Um, yeah, do you wanna make any comments on that? Yeah, I mean, <laughs> the EU is a slow moving animal. Uh, it is like that when you're dealing with 20, say, 27 sovereign states, it, it takes time to, to get decisions. And even something which seemed for the outside world, um, something very simple as sanctions, um, the EU is still, believe it or not, you know, still a, a community based on rule of law. So when you put someone on sanctions, you have to have uh, good grounds to put someone on a sanctions list. Uh, you have, to, you have to have concrete evidence and because um, this can all be tested in European Court of Justice. Uh, even Lukashenko can go to the European Court of Justice. This is what many Ukrainian oligarchs who are on, on the EU sanctions list are doing and sometimes they've even won. So it takes quite a lot of time actually to, to put people on the sanctions list because it has to be legally watertight, first of all. The other thing is, of course, yes, uh, you probably read it in newspapers, the EU wanted to put sanctions on, on Belarus Pretty much two, two, well, one, two weeks after after the crackdown, after the elections, but then obviously Cyprus blocked it for two, for almost two months because they wanted to link sanctions to uh, sanctions against Turkey, and that, that sort of is a typical EU thing that you know, like you have to have unanimity when it comes to sanctions, and and uh, to get everyone on board takes time. It takes diplomatic efforts and time. So um, the EU will never be fast on anything. I remember it took them six months to, to come up with economic sanctions uh, against Russia for its annexation of Crimea back in 2014. So, so if you want speed, don't, don't turn to Brussels. Uh, that's my recommendation. <laughs> if you want speed, turn to Hungary. <laughs> because that's the weakest link in, in, in support for any, any sanction or any measure. Okay, so I'm gonna move on to the next question. So, um, and it says, given the current strong um, Russian support for Lukashenko, um, the only path forward seems to be for Western community to acknowledge Putin's role and engage with him. 
uh, would opening up diplomatic channels with communications between Brussels and Washington uh, and Moscow be, be options? Um, and I'll, 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 I'll pose this question um, to Alex. Um, I think it would be extremely wrong, both politically, but also morally, because by doing so, uh, the West would subscribe to the Kremlin's view of spheres of influence and of Moscow's special rights in what it views as its near abroad. So I think it would be extremely wrong. It would be, you know, going back to, back to Yalta and uh, the world leader sitting down and drawing lines on a map. This is yours and this is mine. So, you know, from, from this perspective, this will be something that will be uh, not democratic, will not be accepted by a lot of people in Belarus and will not be accepted by a lot of people in the West. Uh, I think more logical steps would be to uh, also use those methods which are limited. I completely agree with Ricard that the West doesn't have a lot of leverage over Belarus for obvious political and economic reasons. But sanctions can be applied not only to Belarusian individuals and businesses linked to Lukashenko, but against, for instance, Russian businesses, which are supporting Lukashenko, which are dealing with Lukashenko. So if, if there would be these measures in place, which will punish Russian individuals and Russian firms for their links to Lukashenko, that can make an impact on Russian actions vis-a-vis uh, -vis Belarus. Sorry, I've talked a lot, but can I, can I, can I come in on that a little bit as well, uh, if I may? <laughs> you know, I, you always hear, or not always, but sometimes you hear this in, in some Western European capitals, notably Paris, that, you know, oh, we need to have open communication channels with, with Moscow. And yes, I totally agree with that, but we already have. And this is the sort of thing, like, we, it's sort of like, sometimes I get the feeling when I listen to some people that, oh, you know, we're not talking to Moscow. Most, you know, Russia is present in the OSCE. Russia is present in the UN. The problem is that they're simply not willing to engage on this question. They're blocking everything. Uh, talk about the OSCE, for example. Like, they've blocked every single step. Uh, there's now uh, in the works a, a declaration um, because there is an OSCE ministerial that's going to take place next week. Uh, and there is a declaration about Belarus that Russia currently is blocking. There will not be an OSCE declaration. Uh, I talked briefly about this. There was a Moscow mechanism that was launched by the OSCE by 17 states with a rapporteur, an Austrian rapporteur, human rights lawyer that Miklos knows as well, of course, who was supposed to go to Belarus, but, but Russia completely blocked that uh, and they didn't acknowledge it. So, so the whole thing about you know, needing to engage with Russia, the EU, uh, OCE, UN, we are engaging with Russia all the time, but they're not willing to play ball. And that, that, that's the bottom line. Which can go, of course, um, both ways. Sometimes this, um, this resolute desire um, of Putin to block the, the, the whole inherited international system prompts in a strange way a kind of appeasement. So let's hope that, that uh, the right conclusion is driven from, from this very apparent, very, very clear uh, will of Putin to, to totally annihilate the, the inherited international system. And, and, um, and the human rights as a, as a kind of measurement of, of, of quality of society and democracy. So, yes, I, all I wanted to say that sometimes, right now, as you mentioned, France, I can mention Hungary, and it always somehow rev revives appeasement as, as an alternative way of approaching the problem. Uh, might I might I chime in uh, at the the end to the end to end this question? Um, is that I, I was actually listening to a U.S. policymaker um, speak today and and was received he received a very similar question about um, you know will the U.S. Uh, you know why doesn't the U.S. directly speak with um, with Belarus and you know to to get things done? And the the policymaker is like yeah no we'll we're going to speak to Russia first. So that, that's what he said, I'm just chiming in. Anyways, 
Um, moving on to the last question here, I believe it's um, it's uh, th these events usually end around seven twenty, seven thirty. I'm sorry, uh, Peter. One question: Was this a still a Trumpian guy, or was was a more Biden type? He well, he liked to pretend that he was neither. However, I I believe he was a Biden type. And he was oh. saying that just the, the the policy establishment in the U.S. sort of has a lot of trouble separating Belarus from Russia, right? So that was just that was what he chimed in with. Okay, so the last question was, um, uh, what do speakers think of tensions um, that uh, seem resurfacing again between uh, Russia? Uh, and Lukashenko, whereby there's been a, a bit of criticism coming from Moscow of um, the sort of the harsh crackdown, the sort of human rights violations that um, we've been seeing in uh, in, in Belarus. Um, uh, yeah. Anybody want to make a comment on that? Um, uh, if I may, um, I think, it, again, it's... Uh... It's part of an attempt to uh, weaken uh, Lukashenko's negotiating position further vis-a-vis -vis Moscow, uh, uh, introducing criticisms of his actions at home. Uh, it makes him weaker. Uh, so from the Russian perspective, uh, it makes perfect sense because uh, Russia would be willing to push uh, its objectives, policy objectives in Belarus, uh, politically, militarily, uh, or uh, economically uh, on Lukashenko um uh, because he feels weakened so i think it's very um it's a very common strategy by russia to weaken your um negotiating position uh by presenting you in bad light so nothing but that 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 wasn't put too far that i thought because it was it was um only in the pro putin media that they criticized the, the the handling of the, the protest. So on the official side, they never did that. They were careful not to do that. All right, and um, uh, to the, the organizer of the event, do we have time for one more question or, yeah? Okay. Um, so I wanted to, uh, bring things back sort of to the beginning of these protests, because I, I thought that the, uh, if any, and this is, I'm opening this to everyone, about um, the impact of the coronavirus that this has had on these protests, because what I was so surprised about when I spoke to other analysts is how they said the protests this time around are very, it was described as horizontal, Whereas you don't have huge, I mean, before they were showing up, yes, in the center of Minsk. However, the protests are now countrywide in neighborhoods and things. And I thought this might have a connection to the coronavirus and how the awful government handling of the coronavirus led to more civil society coming together on the internet, on Telegram and things like this to communicate. And that sort of laid the groundwork for communication which then led to wider protests. So yes, please, Mikor. I think um, the, the mishandling and lying away of the corona crisis by Lukashenko revived Chernobyl in the, in the, in the, in the Belarusian soul, maybe, um, maybe um, has, has, has the, has the lady who, who tackled the, the national issue lost left? She lo okay, yeah, we lost her. So the point is, um, I believe that it revived the sentiment which, which, which greatly um, contributed to the fall of the Soviet Union back in the late 80s, that total power is not only not helpful, it actually kills. Uh, through mismanagement, through lies, through um, media, media silence, and, and through propaganda, and and uh, you are you are right. That feeling was sank into the families in Belarus. So it 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 has become a family conviction, probably the strongest political. 
conviction that were that that was shared by across large families and across Belarus and not not around party line not, not around ideological line or any other so i believe that is that is something that contributed to the to the moral fall and for the final moral fall of lukashenko if if i may come in as well um uh, i i agree uh, with uh, professor haristy that coronavirus did play a role and the fact that the government lukashenko specifically was so dismissive about uh, the uh, disease he was claiming that it does not exist so there are no reasons to try to protect uh, yourself uh, has just shown how vulnerable people are and i can tell it from you know anecdotal experience of my own family which is still in belarus um, a lot of uh, a lot of uh, people in my family are uh, much older they are retired uh, and they're not in perfect uh, health and they had to uh, make the decisions on changing their behavior and adapting to the fact that there is a pandemic themselves because the government wasn't issuing any suggestions the government wasn't doing anything so they had to start wearing masks they had to to stop going to places they had to start staying more at home in order to protect themselves because they knew that if something happens to them you know what are the chances okay they are in minsk they might be lucky they might get you know into a decent hospital uh, and get treated but you know those people who are not in minsk who are living in small towns with much poorer healthcare infrastructure um I think that had a big impact, especially on older people uh, who traditionally were more um, willing to vote for Lukashenko and support him in the elections. Um, I think this was definitely a factor. Okay, everyone. Uh, so I would like to just say thank you to all of you. Uh, thank you so much, uh, well, to the organizers for putting this round table together um and for constantly being in contact with me and also thank you so much to our speakers tonight alex uh, ricard uh Miklos. i've really enjoyed listening to all of you and also thank you to the floor for your questions uh, i really appreciate it and i can't promote enough please come to the next um round table event on the 9th of december and please come to the uh, or uh, you know sign up for and present at or please come and uh listen to the uh uh, Belarusian Studies in the 21st Century Conference. Uh, the link is in the comments. Okay, Jive Belarus. Yes. Thank you so much. Thanks Thank a lot. You. Thank you for organizing. Thank you very much for coming. Really appreciate it. Thank Thanks you. Thank you for your insight. Thank you so much. Bye bye.